Welcome back to The Morning Brew here on CNC3. I am Natalie Lagor. Just about five minutes after the hour of a seven o'clock, the show ends at eight. So I hope you're tuned in. And wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us here on The Brew. Now, the 24th of September is celebrated as Republic Day here in Trinidad and Tobago, even though it was proclaimed on the 1st of August in 1974, uh, 1976. So to speak to us this morning about what it means to be a republic is Dr. Michael Toussaint, who is a history lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Good morning to you, Dr. Toussaint. Present good morning to you and present good morning to the listening audience and all of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, thank you. Oh, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for joining us this morning in the great Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. You know, for me personally, the first question is what's the difference really between a republic and a democracy? Well, the difference is not one of the difference between a republic and a democracy. Democracy has to do with being governed by the people in such a manner that one hears their voice and respond to the issues that they raise, they raise and their needs and wants and the way to go forward. Republicanism is a form of governance, government, a form of governance. And there's a slight distinction between government and governance. Um, the thing about a republic is that it jettisons or throw over, uh, overboard or throw away the whole notion of dominance and control by a monarchy. And if I may explain that in Trinidad and Tobago's terms, or the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago's terms, in 1962, we won independence. But we remained a monarchy a constitutional monarchy. That is, here is Trinidad and Tobago independent. You have a prime minister, but the prime minister is a head of government, and head of government. He's a head of government. And there's also a head of state, and that is the British monarchy. And the governor general who would have been retained the governor who would have been retained after independence was the representative of the crown. He's representative, representing the crown. And the prime minister is administrating Trinidad. Well, that's a huge deficit, depending on how you look at it. It meant that the control of our armed forces and our foreign policy, as examples, were um, subject to British dictate. And this is the state or condition of many countries in the English speaking Caribbean. Well, so let's take, for example, Jamaica, that has still remained a monarchy. Are you suggesting to me that the control of the armed forces is still rests with the monarchy? Well, it is not that the monarchy simply controls you, but they have a certain level of influence. And I would use the Trinidad example and the Jamaican example and some other Caribbean example. There was a mutiny. Well, that's how it was expressed in 1970. And it involved the armed forces in Trinidad resisting orders from the state and the government and going against the government. But do you know how the charges were coined when it reached the court? It was a mutiny not against Eric Williams and the government of Trinidad and Tobago, but her Britannic Majesty. That is how the charges were structured. And we have a situation in Trinidad where a lot of people think that it was a charge against the government of Trinidad and Tobago, or they were charged with, with, with acting contrary to the, 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 the lawful orders of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. They were, in fact, defying the British government, and I'm not so sure that they were even aware, because, but that is how the charges came out in the court. And students write and discuss these things, and you have to say, well, that's not what it is. That's not what was happening at all. Another example would have been Grenada and St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the islands that would have supported the move to enter in Grenada when there was this Grenada revolution and the virtual bloodbath under the Maurice Re um, Bishop regime. These countries could not simply say, we are going to go in Grenada. They had to get permission from the British crown. And Grenada was actually a British colony until it was overtaken by the regime and you had what you call a revolution. 
The misconception is that America invaded Grenada. In a, in, a, in a broader sense, America invaded the British realm, so there had to be a level of collaboration there for America to do that. And yet people are unaware of it. There are certain sensitivities and subtleties and, and other aspects of this that are critically important at times. Dr. Tuse, stay with us. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we continue the discussion. 14 minutes after the hour of 7 o'clock. Welcome back to The Morning Brew here on CNC3. We're talking to history lecturer Dr. Michael Toussaint about Trinidad and Tobago becoming a republic in 1976. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Toussaint. Fine, thank you. Yes. So you were, t you were explaining to us that it's not just a, a, a titular thing. It's not just a title. It's that the armed forces were controlled by the monarch. And when there was considered mutiny, that it was a mutiny against the, 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 the monarchy and not necessarily against the state of Trinidad and Tobago. That's absolutely right. Right. So obviously there's a huge difference between being a monarchy and as Jamaica is and being a republic as a Trinidad and Tobago is. So let's talk about the benefits then of being a republic. Well, republicanism means public affairs. And you can match it with another term called democracy because the whole idea is that the people become more involved with ruling themselves. But the essence of republicanism is that you take responsibility for your country and you enjoy the sovereignty that our nation, a nation is supposed to have. You actually supposed to enjoy the sovereignty that is constituted in the Declaration of Independence, but unless you do not move to a higher stage of responsibility for yourself and sovereignty, which means control over yourself and your state, and your nation, then what you are doing is virtually allowing a certain level of foreign control, being subjugated, and there is not that maximization of the sovereignty that should be yours. What you're going to have is what we call in history and sociology and politics and so on, those sciences, flag independence. You have independence, you have a national anthem, you have national birds and you have flowers, but you are not finally in control of your country. Right. And in terms of the Constitution, what changes would have had to be made to ensure that the republicanism of Trinidad and Tobago is shown even at the constitutional level? Well, one of the critical changes would be, have been that the governor would have been replaced by a president. Two, the armed forces would have become, would have been under the control of the, 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 the president. Foreign policy would have been under the control of the president as opposed to being dictated to or being um, controlled to a, a reasonable extent, but perhaps too much by the governor general acting in the interest of the crown. Then, for example, the cabinet has to be sworn in by the president. In the case of the Williams regime, when he got independence, the British government attempted to exercise a certain level of control over the parliament. All of these uh, authorities, these rights shift to the president. It is the president who swears in people, including the prime minister, the attorney general, and the cabinet, the leader of the opposition, the senators in the opposition, the opposition members. These are the responsibilities of the, of the president. You would recall that there were times in the history of Trinidad and Tobago when the president had to decide who will be the prime minister. These kinds of, 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 of powers, and I, I'm reminded of a statement by one of our past presidents, powers I have, one of our past <laughs> excellencies, powers I have, I have and powers I don't. Yes. These things rest with the president. Before that, it rested with the governor general. And I don't know if people knew this. There was a time when Uriah Butler won the, the, the elections in Trinidad and the, the government, the, 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 the monarchy and the, and the governor general simply refused to put him into office and, 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 and they put Albert Gomes. Right. So I, 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 I hope this explains to you what is really happening in terms of constitutional changes. And of course, there are other things that we can talk about. That right. Thing. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the role 
of the president because some people in Trinidad and Tobago seem to believe that it's just a title. But let us look at what would have happened if uh, the government, if the governor general had to determine who would have become the next prime minister, would he, would he have had to consult with the monarchy in terms of making that decision? Well, I think he would have had to consult with the monarchy and the obvious direction of the consultation would have, would have been the monarchy would have asked him, well, who do you think? Because when it came down to the president, it, it would have been that the president was telling us who he thought should have been the prime minister. And, and if anybody knows about that conversation, there was Kamala Ali Mohammed and Errol Mahabi, and then there was George Chambers, and the president made the decision that the prime minister would be George Chambers. The role of the president, people think that the president does not do anything. But I want to remind citizens of this country is that when there was that fiasco in 1990 with the guys who you know, attempted to take power in a military coup. A pardon was issued, and it was from the presidential office. That was the start of the dilemma, and that held up in court. So you understand the power that we are dealing with. Right, well, there let's... power. Let's but talk you have about... To understand its context. Let's talk about some of those powers that the president can exercise, because I myself struggle sometimes to understand the role of the president except to just assign stuff on behalf of the prime minister and the government. Well, the, the thing about the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the president is a ceremonial. So that means he is symbolic at a particular level. It is different from the American president, who, of course, America is a republic, who is an executive person. Our president is a symbol of our nationhood and the conscience of the country. He reflects our aspirations and our sense of identity as a sovereign nation, but it is ceremonial. But he has thought. The president can investigate, um, conduct, he can respond to queries from citizens. There have been situations when a certain prime minister was in trouble and people took information to the president and he made decisions on the grounds of what he called what? Moral and spiritual values. So that the president has power. When the prime minister decides that he is going to get rid of a minister, he has to appoint, uh, inform his excellency that this minister is no longer in that portfolio. And the president then takes it from there and how the president the, the, the person removed from office. When laws are made in the parliament and the senate, it is the president who has to declare it until it's declared it's not the law. Are we following what I'm saying? So the president has power. It is not true or accurate or incontrovertible, the statement that the president doesn't do anything. The president does a lot. Of, but the thing about the president, our president is a ceremonial president. What we have not gotten to is the level of an executive president. And that is something the country might need to consider. Because I know from some of the work that I would have had to do that there were um, prime ministers in Trinidad, or at least a prime minister, who was contemplating significantly the transformation of the constitution to have an executive president. The Cuban president, and let's talk about the republics in the Caribbean. Uh, uh, Cuba, then the Dominican Republic. And then you have Trinidad and Tobago, and you have Guyana, and you have Dominica, which is more or less a president, but almost a president, like a prime ministerial situation. An executive president, like the president of the United States, he has the last say on the declaration of war. That's not necessarily a state in Trinidad and Tobago. There must be consultation between the governor, the, the prime minister, and the president. But here in Trinidad and Tobago, the president takes a lot of advice from the prime minister. It does not necessarily mean that the president is absolutely without power or, uh, or room in which to maneuver. I can remember a situation in which uh, you know, a certain prime minister decided to appoint as government senators many people who had lost the election and almost the whole package, the whole group, and he was advised by the, the, the president, you know that is not because these people did not match the will of the citizenry 
that voted, and therefore it is not proper. And that caused a very sour, sour state that appears to be you. Prime and Minister. Dr. Tusi, that's what I wanted to find out from you. We know that the Prime Minister consults with the President or to advise the President on whether or not he wants a minister, hire a minister, fire a minister. Is the pre does the President have the authority to say, to accept or reject that appointment? That is shaped by another dimension of our Constitution. The President has to appoint the person who, in his view, can control or control or has the majority of support in the House of Representatives. Okay? And there are occasions when such a decision emerges. If people place a notion of no confidence in the Prime Minister and there's a debate, according to the voting, it would be obvious as to whether people um, have chosen to allow the person to continue in office or they are supposed to be in office or, 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 or be put out of office. And that happened in, 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 in the case of Mr. Pandey, when I think it was Ramesh Lawrence, Murad, Trevor Sudama, and somebody else um, decided, okay, that's it. And then what happens is that the prime minister must now inform the nation and the government and so on and so on that cap, cap parliament will be prorogued and they are going to go back to the polls. So that the, the president has power to act, but he cannot just arbitrarily do that. But there are situations when it might work in the disfavor of the, of, of the prime minister. That is why many prime ministers normally call elections if they, they think there will be success in a no confidence motion. Because the president is duty bound constitutionally to put into power or to put into office that person who, in his view, can control the majority vote in the, in the parliament, the House of Representatives. And that situation emerges all the time. That is the nature of the Trinidad Constitution, it may exist in a different um, uh, framework in, our, in, in, in other countries. This is our reality here. Right. So you believe that thought should be given to having an executive president, but then what becomes of the prime minister if we do go that route? That again will be another constitutional challenge. Trinidad has never been um, subjected to a, an absolutely unchangeable constitution. I often hear people talking about the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. What I notice is they don't talk about the constitution of Tobago and Trinidad and Tobago and the numerous amendments. There are amendments to the constitution all the time. And that is of necessity. But constitutional change is something that we need to consider in Trinidad because our constitution is still problematic. We're talking about the republic, and if I may, with your permission, bring us back to something. We have a tendency in, 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 in Trinidad and Tobago to place all matters before the Privy Council. Judicial committee, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, right? And, and, and that means that this supersedes our high courts and our, 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 our courts of the highest standing. And the, 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 the anomaly and the contrary aspect of it is that Trinidad and Tobago is the headquarters of the CCJ, the Caribbean Court of Justice. And yet, because of the nature of the politics of Trinidad and Tobago, we have not allowed ourselves to be ruled by it. Because people think there are so many racial issues and so many issues and the lawyers and so on, they're all in the Caribbean and it will be problematic for them to rule in matters. They ruled and they had a lot to do with the resolving of the situation in Guyana. Okay? The, the whole idea is that when you are a, a constitutional monarchy, nations tend to rest in the assurance that anything we could go to the foreign power and solicit and they will help us. You're not really taking responsibility for yourself. It's like a footballer who can play football and score goals, but he says, I don't want to score too many goals because I don't want to play at my best. And, and that's how we can look at it. Or a cricketer who decides, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bowl as many good balls as I should, although I can, because I want to be able to have some, rule, some, some room for not bowling well. All right. So we do need to take the CCJ as the head uh, of the, of the uh, judicial system here in Trinidad and Tobago. But as you said, it has not been adopted even though the head office is here. So Would you repeat that question for me? No, I'm saying that even though the head office is here for the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice, Trinidad and Tobago still goes to the Privy Council with a lot of matters. So in other words, even though we're a Republican, we're a public, uh, sorry, that we have not adopted all of the things that would say we are fully in charge of ourselves. And, that, that is, and, and I'm making the point that that is precisely what happened to constitutional monarchy. 
people in constitutional monarchies behave as though they are not sure or confident about their ability to self-govern. And the constitutional monarchies set themselves up to be dominated by foreign powers. And that is where the difficulty emerges. We have the ability, in fact, let me make a statement from my own reading of historical development. The Caribbean is, is, is coming into its own. This is one of the best places, one of the best regions in the world. We have a lot to teach about the past and human development and about ennobling our civilization. But we are not aware of that because we think everything that is there or there from the, uh, the former rulership is the best thing for us. And that is actually the opposite of what happens. Even in Britain and so on, the Privy Council is on the challenge. In Britain, we talk, for example, about separation of, of the powers of, of, of the executive, you know, separation of powers, the judiciary and the legislative body. But the Chancellor of the Exchequer was, was the connection between all of these three domains of powers which should have been separate. The law, for example, the, the management of the economy and the legislator, and, and, and they question that in Britain. And it is the, the impression that the British government and its Privy Council is absolutely above board. That's not the nature of how this thing operates. And we have to examine ourselves and our ability to right. really understand our situation and take it from where it is Dr. and, Toussaint, it and do the best that we can. We are out of time, but my final question to you, how should we celebrate Republic Day here in Trinidad and Tobago? in the manner that we celebrate independence. If you watch an independence parade, you will see that all the, the offices of Trinidad and Tobago, the defense offices of Trinidad and Tobago, celebrate in front of the president, the prime minister is also there. We should shift that institution of celebration and its framework, firstly, to Republic Day. But I'll tell you something. And I want us to pay careful attention to this. We have a problem in Trinidad. I think it's in 1996. The, the celebration of Republic Day was actually removed. That and with Monday, to put in place the Baptist holiday and Indian arrival day. No problem with that. But they should not have removed the celebration of independence. That is where we are mentally. And I think the Prime Minister is right in that we should be teaching civics in school. But if I may make a, a plug for the discipline in which I'm involved, you can't teach civics unless you understand history. And when you can teach civics and you can teach it through understanding history and whatnot, then people can understand the significance of their celebration and what is necessary for national development, self-identity, and a better world civilization, and fitting into that in, within that in the context of your own country. All right, Dr. Tuesday, I want to thank you so much for this history lesson. I don't think that there's one person who would have heard this interview who isn't richer for it. And even outside of Republic Day, I really hope it's one of these conversations that we can definitely carry on to understand what it really means to be a republic. So thank you so much for being with us here this morning on The Morning Brew. Dr. Michael Tusi, a lecturer, history lecturer at the University of the West Indies, and he says somehow we seem to be afraid to govern ourselves even though we do have the ability. So we take a break and we'll be back with you.